23 years old. I've been breaking for around 20 years. Started in 2000. When did you start breaking? It was very like innocent at school. One guy showed me uh, the yoga freeze. And he's like, can you do it? It was just like uh, like a hype, you know, like a lot of kids started breaking. And then I found out my two older cousins were breaking. So I learned a little bit the basics from them. They were a bit more further than me. There was uh, like a very, very big hype in my in my hometown. hometown. So I was living in Tilburg North. The north, I think you can walk from north to south in the north for like 10 minutes. So it's, it's quite small. And we had like uh, five schools and each neighborhood had a crew of kids. What was your crew? My first, very, yeah. very first crew. <laughs> the name was Chicos Locos MCs. Okay. <laughs> Is it still now? Like, no, 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 no. no. It, it, uh, it's not existing anymore. I think I was the only one at the end that was still, still training. The crew of my cousins was uh, Ultimate MCs. They were a bit better. We locked up to them, so that's why we took the name also with MCs. It came from that. Cisco was was also in this crew. Cisco was always the like best youth friend of my cousin, so I was always connected already with them since. Uh, since a very young age. Early on, like when you began, you went to see some battle, especially the battle of the year, 2001 or 2002, I don't know. There you saw B-boy Taisuke from Japan. He was already strong. So what did you think about that, that day? Someday you will have this level of breaking? No, never. No, I was, uh, I remember because Taisuke was, and he, I think he even appeared younger than he really was, but he was like a kid and I was still learning my windmill and Taisuke was already like, <laughs> okay, doing f -lifts. And this day I remember like, holy shit, I'm so far behind, you know, it's, uh, it's never going to be possible to reach or to catch up with guys from that level. So it was motivating in a way, but it was also demotivating. But you know, when you, when you just start breaking, everything you see is dope. Because you go to the cypher and you see somebody warm up and he almost do an air flare and it's already, you're already amazed by it, you know. And I think this is something to uh, be aware of and to appreciate in the beginning of the dance because the longer you dance, the more critical your eye will be and the more harder it becomes to like enjoy to see like uh, people break in general you like, know? how is it now are you still enjoying some steps when you turn around the wall yeah for sure but uh, i have to say like when you when you judge an event there's maybe 20 percent in the lineup that you really like okay you really like it you know so a small proportion so like. a small proportion and then when you just begin with breaking i think it's like uh, it's maybe the opposite it's like uh, 90 percent or something you're amazed by and do you think that you were naturally gifted uh, no not at all when i was started i was definitely not one of the talented ones that started around in my area i remember everybody was training roll back to one hand or elbow to one hand for me i was very slow with picking up these things in the beginning but i found uh, my creativity to find other ways to do it so i kind of discovered creativity through breaking i was already used to fall because i did i did judo before so it gives you a little bit of sense of balance and the way you can drop on the floor when you have a child, you go to the consultation center and uh, they check the development of how you move and how you see and how you talk and etc. And uh, they found out that I was kind of, uh, my, my balance was a little bit off. If they asked me okay. to do a roll to the front, I would roll to the side. And then they advised my parents, like, put him on judo because judo is a, is a game of balance. If you pull somebody, he's gonna throw you this way. But if you push somebody, Control this way, so you're constantly in between the balance. So that was my first touch with like mo movement in a way. And I heard that it was really long for you to understand breaking, like 10 years maybe. How do you explain that? I don't think 10 years is long. I think it's it's average. Even now, after 20 years, I'm still I'm still learning, you know. And I think that's the beauty of breaking. You're never there, you know. That's why it's so addictive, also, because you can always develop. There's always parts to improve. So this is uh, I think what makes break special. Before 2007, you used a lot of sets in your rounds. Why did you start to change it? after this year? I think one of the first thing was like when I started going to Circle Kings, I was exposed a bit more to like the cypher culture of, of breaking and you just look stupid if you run the same sets in the cypher over and over, you know? Also like the cyphers are small so you need to be able to adjust more. 
and then when you when you're starting to get a name and you do different battles every week people start to see your rounds and it starts to be predictable you know that's the opposite what i want with my breaking i want my breaking to be unpredictable because i, I cannot get it from like the the sense of doing something physically super hard i need to surprise you you need to be like huh huh that's that's where my power is so that's the first time where i was like okay i'm doing a lot of battles and in a way it's giving me a success because i made my name and i won competitions like uk champs and stuff but something didn't feel right and i feel i had to go back to the process and switch it up a little bit and i was inspired by people like atta and you saw flomo and rocksteady crew skill methods they were so free in their dance it's a lot of freestyle but it's also a lot of basic like baby freeze halo swipe and you could almost like describe what they did and my philosophy and my break is i don't want people to be able to describe what i do so you would rarely see me do a round where you can be like he did a, a six step to a swipe windmill tap mill chair freeze do this and that all the basics that are in it but they would be like uh air baby to something weird to a cc to something weird like there's like a, a switch to something creative all the time and that's the way i break in a way with my sets but i was like i want to be able to be more free with that so that was a bit my point where i was like okay i wanna switch it up a little bit so now how are your sets made They'll, I have like short pieces and they can match. I like to compare it a little bit like uh, Knex. It's something similar to uh, Lego. Is it the Meno style? A little bit, yes. And can you elaborate on that? Like, what is the Meno style for you? It's just my way. Uh, it's hard to explain. But I like to use shapes and concepts and uh, transitions mixed with uh, authentic b-boy touch. And why do you think that you are successful in battle? I think because I have uh, a lot of material and a lot of people they just run out of moves. Where I, when I go, come closer to the final, I feel like that's when I can start firing. It's hard to even to do all my material in one event, so I never need to worry too much about what I still have left. So I get more dangerous towards the final and I think that's my, my strength. I feel when you make eye contact, you can sense if they're ready or nervous or not. Often the first one that looks down is the one who is more nervous and it's already like a small victory in a way, I think. And uh, I don't know, it, it just takes a lot of control to be in control of your movements and to be still, to be really talking to somebody. I think this shows a lot of dominance in, uh, in the battle if you really if you really show that you're really talking to somebody instead of you're like more like in yourself. How do you manage to remember the things that you didn't do before and at the same time being in the moment? Yeah, you just need to block what you've already done. So if something comes up and you in, in your freestyle and like, oh, you want to go somewhere and you feel, oh, I've already, already been there, you need to just choose another direction to work your way out of it. But also preparing before the battle so you make at least like three points, like a beginning, a middle and, a, and an ending of okay. movements that you can use whenever you uh, whenever you're lost in the battle. Another thing that I use is uh, I was reading this a part of this book about memory sport and there's people that, uh, that are very strong at memory, they can read like a full page and remember it after one time reading it and they have like uh, tactics for it something is called memory castles you heard of that no never to memorize a, a long list of words they go to uh, they imagine a, a house their house mm -hmm. a place they're very very familiar with and then they imagine themselves walking in seeing the well, when i walk into my home i see the books with the jackets okay and then you can remember like a jacket that's hanging there, put it, connect it with a memory. Go straight and there's a toilet, the toilet goes like this. You remember it of your backspin, for example. Okay. They do this with words and I was thinking like, how can I mix this idea with remembering my material? Because that's a very important part in breaking, is memorizing your stuff. So I made my how my body the, the memory castle. So I have a lot of movements where, for example, my foot is more dominant. Like I grab my foot and I pull back or I do a, a L kick drop with my foot or many things where like I use my whole body of course but my foot grabbing my foot is the dominant part so I just connect a lot of moves to my foot I collect a lot of parts to my knees I connect parts to uh, moves to my chin to my shoulder to my head to my back and then when I feel I have a uh, 
a blackout, I just think about parts of my body and that helps me to bring back uh, movements in the moment. Also like um, giving moves names helps a lot for remembering stuff. The first BC1 you won was against Taisuke. So what changed for you since that day? A lot because uh, after I get the Red Bull contract and uh, just gives a lot more security about, uh, about my role of a competitive b-boy. Before that you, you li I was living from breaking but you're still like surviving in a way you know and it's hard to save up for later and you just live in the moment with not a lot of security. After that it gives a bit more peace in your head like okay I'm actually living off this and it just gives you a more better focus to evolve your dance. It just opened many doors in general. Before joining the BC1 All-Stars, you were living from breaking by doing battles or by doing like performance and shows? A bit of everything, just anything that comes on your path, you, you take it. I won UK Champs in 2007, that's where I made my debut a little bit and the international scene, so I was started traveling a bit already, doing gigs here and there, but still it's like uh, not really in a, a, a security. So then you, I did like theater productions, stuff you like to do, but at the end you prefer just to battle, you know, in that moment, but you still feel like, okay, I'm still gonna do this tour because there's more financial security. And then this tool gives you like 30 dates in a full year and you're kind of stuck to it, you sign the contract. So that year I could go to PC1 in uh, Rio de Janeiro, but I had a performance booked. Ah. You signed so you cannot go. That type of stuff, like after getting the Red Bull contract, was like, okay, I just... <laughs> yeah, it's done. Yeah. Right. Since you are a Red Bull All-Star member, how do you prepare for a battle? Train really hard. Okay. <laughs> Like, do you have a specific method? Uh, I think the best thing before to train before a battle is is just to drill your drill rounds. You dance the way you want to dance in the competition. So you just do as much as round as possible and practice and execute them fully. So this is like two two types of training to me. There's one where you just focus on creating, and I feel like I'm practice every day like that because it doesn't need to be super physically challenging and uh, there's the one where you just drill your rounds and you battle versus your crew members and you just you just go hard and you do it so you get your rounds in your muscle memory you get it in your mind and you make sure your execution is on point yeah and study study your material watch videos write down your stuff not even to uh, write it down and like look it up, but just to write it, write everything down, just to scrape it from your memory in a way. I think this is uh, very, very important to prepare mentally also. How do you train your mind? I think visualizing is very good. So you just close your eyes and you just train in your head. You do rounds that you never even done be because you, I think every breaker knows this thought when you have like an idea and you kind of see it in your mind and then you do it and boom it just works. So I think this is very important to like uh, run over, go over your rounds, like break really in your head. So now that you are battling a lot with the Red Bull BC1 or like with us all kids, how do you keep bringing something new to the table when you are everywhere? And is it a trouble for you? like? Do you feel some pressure sometimes? I think the best way to do that is to not be everywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, after the third belt and then the WDSF World Championship in Nanjing, I felt like I needed I needed a break from being everywhere all the time. And I was like, I need I need like two years to reinvent myself and to mix everything up and train new things to be part of my system. So I, I stepped back a little bit. Then also I got a wrist injury that took close to two years. So I was breaking for two years like this, like tri tripod mode with my hand. So that kind of forced me to take an extra long break because my goal was to take a break for like, like a year, but it ended up being like almost three years. Of course I was still training, but I was just not battling. So I was training without the pressure of I need to be ready next week or I need to be ready next month. So I had a long creative extension in my training and now I'm coming back since actually Unbreakable was the first 101 that I did after 2019. So I think this is important to not be 
everywhere all the time and to pick your battles wisely because you also get overexposed. Also for the judges even, if you listen your favorite song every day at some point you don't want to listen to it no more. You don't overexpose yourself too much and uh, this will also help to keep this feeling to go to these competitions fresh. Especially now I think it's, uh, it's very difficult sometimes because the events they are super sport related. It just doesn't feel the same like we used to you know so it's like a very heavy mental block to uh, to enjoy it sometimes, I think. And do you feel the need to go to local jams? Yeah, I think it's important, for sure. Like to go like an event like Outbreak or something, you know. I always say um, my battery is totally empty at the end of the week because of also the partying, etc. Yeah. But also my battery is fully charged after after a week of Outbreak, for example. When you're back home, you're like, okay, I need it, I need it. Now you've created Meno Laser, your clothing brand, even Stepix, the dance floor brand. Why do you feel the need to invest in the breaking scene? Stepix is not my is not my okay. creation. It's a creation of uh, two b-boys from from Kazakhstan. They asked me to do a collaboration with uh, with the floor where you explain the the steps. They want to do a collab with me, and then I proposed them the idea to have like a, a floor for the a pro floor, not a beginner floor. And for the Menno Leisure, it started because after every big one-on-one -on -one that I did, I was buying a new tracksuit. I won every time I did that, so it became like a lucky thing in a way. And in that time, it was very difficult to find a, a tracksuit with the pants with just straight leg. You know, it was like uh, in 2000. 13, 12, 14, all the pants were like this, like the soccer pants and it wasn't wasn't my, my style and a guy from Scotland, he hit me up and he designs his own jeans, he makes them by hand, he wanted to send me one of his jeans, but the jeans, he was super passionate about his jeans, but uh, the jeans, the way they were, they were a bit too much for me to wear and I would not battle in it so I told him like they're nice but they're not my style and I don't want to accept something you know just for accept it and I will not be able to represent it right and then he was like oh, you, design, you design your own jeans then you know okay. yeah. <laughs> and I and I told him like I would love to design my own tracksuits and he was like come to Scotland and we do a video with, um, with my jeans and I will help you to design the first tracksuit and then the first Mano Leisure tracksuit was born and I took it to Ukraine to produce uh, this model there together with Intact. So the first need was actually because I just wanted to design my own my, my own outfits and after also a very strong motivation of like there is no breaking scene, uh, breaking brand mm. that's known outside of the breaking scene that other people would wear compared to the skateboard scene. Yeah, really. There are so many brands, you don't need to be uh, a skater to wear uh, skateboard brands, you know, everybody wears it. But still everybody is aware, like, okay, it's a, it's a skating brand, you know. And I, I want something like that for the for the breaking scene as well. And I, I realized all the breaking clothes that were out back then, it's all still very, like, uh, b-boy for life. And I was like, all this breaking brand stuff looks more like merchandise than the actual brand. To see what all the breakers that are actually dope, what they wear, they just like sport brands and stuff, you know. Like the most merchandise I felt it was more for fans almost than for like real b-boys, you know. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create something for them and like a simple logo and something like minimalistic. So that was the, the motivation to create Metal Leisure. I know that you have uh, other passions such as for example photography or art, like uh, painting art. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, when I moved away from my parents' house, I had uh, no internet and no TV for the first months. I always was into like just doodling. That's when I got into painting a little bit. I went from never doing it to like doing it a lot. I can be a little bit extreme sometimes in the in the ways in what I do. When I do something, I fully go for it. So I started painting, trying to find a signature style of creating stuff. And, and photography was just always a passion of me by like traveling and capturing memories and shooting the crew. But then I became a father. I have two kids now and the clothing brand and the dance studio and I'm training for the Olympics and just too many stuff going on in my life that uh, Unfortunately, painting, I don't have time for it at the moment, so I have to like put it in the fridge for now. Photography was also getting a bit away because I started traveling alone a lot, but then it came back with, with doing my clothing brand. 
because I had another another mission for my photography and it became a bit more like fashion photography but like because I shoot most of the photos that's on my uh, Manu Leisure Instagram myself I like to shoot with film and that's the yeah the re the rebirth of my photography let's say painting now hopefully I'll pick it up later again when I break my knee or something I will be uh, <laughs> I'll be back <laughs> Do you have any advice for b-boys? Like, it's the classic one, but I think it's so important, so... Keep really uh, the love for it. Do your research about the, the history. Be very critical to yourself. Do research into music. Be really open to appreciate different music styles. Don't just uh, put on a, a mixtape. Because I think now it's so easy for breakers to go to a practice room and you, like, click. you have like so many choices of breakdance mixtapes but everything is mixed already so it doesn't give you any uh, background about who's the artist what's the name of the song don't be lazy with uh, with your music as a as a breaker you know i think this one is very important because different music styles can make you move different on the floor and uh, it helps you definitely to create in a, in a different way because only breaks breaks are always it's a beat that's like repetitive coming back where if you would practice on jazz music there's more like sideways and different different angles you can take with the music one more important advice as a breaker i think it's very important to uh, find your signature style of, of, of moving. I think you need to be honest with yourself and feel like, okay, where's my talent? Or what, what's something that I really like to do? You make sure you master it. If you can do halos, it's cool. But then if you feel you got a good talent for it, really, really master it. Put all the focus on the, on the halo, one side halo, inside halo, uh, halos, arm crossed, halos here, halos there, halo thread, whatever, like really milk the halo. And when you finally feel like, okay, I, I mastered the halo, you're gonna think like, okay, what's something that really matches this halo movement, you know, something that can be uh, adjustable, like a, like a good add for the halo. So for example, you'd be like, okay, air chairs is nice to mix with halo. So you're gonna master air chairs. Then when you finally finish your air chairs, air chair, elbow, blah, 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 then you go to the next thing, okay, now I think 99 will be nice. Or you, you go focus on air babies. And I think if you really focus on one thing, like a lot, then you're able to make it really yours. And then when you put it together, slowly you will start creating a signature style. Because if you just train everything all the time, you just train everything a bit, nothing will stick out, you know, everything will be like uh, generic you know so i think it's really really important to find that focus part and be like okay i need this and i want to be the best of it and then when you feel you're like you really master it you go to the next and if i can translate my breaking when i started everything was from baby freeze baby freeze walk baby freeze jump baby freeze spin baby freeze windmill at some point i went to scandinavia and they shook my hand like this they're like yo what's up <laughs> and then i started searching on sliding Head slide, elbow slides, knee slides, shoulder slide, any slide I could do, mix it together with my baby freeze. Then I start creating rolling, different ways of rolling. Rolling to stand up, rolling like this, like this. Then back rocks. So you see every time I pick something that I always also feel like, okay, not many people are really digging. So to have a focus on something simple, where you feel like, okay, not many people focus on this, that will make you stand out quicker. That's how you can create a, a signature style. How often do you practice weekly so that it's not too hard for your health? And do you eat something special? Like, do you have a special diet? I train uh, around five times a week, usually from eight till 11. I used to practice like kill myself, okay. but now I try to like even it so I can actually practice every day. I think I try to do uh, some days like more intense and other days I practice more light. Diet wise, I've been a little bit off lately, but in general I just try to, uh, to eat the most healthy that I can. Try to avoid sodas, drink more water and uh, take your vitamins, you know, fish oil, vitamin D, stuff like that. Magnesium after practice, but I've been slacking. Also. Okay. <laughs> How do you manage your uh, dancer career on the long term after winning big champs? 
finding out right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's uh, you know if you choose dance for make a living, you you kind of choose to live in the moment and uh, you just do it fully. And uh, that's why I try to build more than just uh, being a dancer. I, I build my studio. I work on a new generation. I try to add something to the scene, like give something back by uh, creating a, a workshop program, clothing brand. I really enjoy enjoy teaching, so I do. Uh, I give private courses now. Yeah, just just be really aware of also how your network works and, and the people you roll with, and just to you need to be like uh, an entrepreneur, you know, to make it happen. Because if you just dance and you just focus on the dancing and that's the only thing you do, you you 40 and then you're like, whoa, what now, you know? So. I think it's very important to, to always be aware of that. But at the same time, I think breaking this way gives you such a big network that if you switch to photography or videography or MCing or, or DJing, you already have a very big network of people. You know, if you start to make websites or you want to go into manage dance so there are so many sideways, I think. Because in the scene, we need definitely more than just good b-boys, you know?